My name is Bob Wood. I'm director for the Down East Fisheries Partnership and member of the Living Tides. I want to tell you a little bit about the Down East Fisheries Partnership, though it's not the main subject of the story here. We are a, a collaborative group of nine organizations whose mission is to restore and sustain Down East Fisheries to help our natural and human communities thrive. In this case, Down East Fisheries, Down East, the region, um, we define as Washington and Hancock counties in far northeastern or Down East Maine. Our vision is to uh, is for our fisheries to sustain our communities and our communities sustain our fisheries. Those two are clearly intertwined in our natural resource fishery dependent communities here in down East Maine. But as I said, my story today is really about a group called the Living Tides. That group got its story in a class. We were invited to participate in a workshop which turned into a longer class. And the workshop was designed to help us tell our story of place. It was put on by Sustainometrics, uh, an organization that helped us and helped other groups. We were all doing this together. There were many groups from all over the world. Um, and we were here representing at first what was called uh, the Cobbs Cook Bay bioregion, I believe. And the objective here in brief is, to, is for groups from that place or elsewhere to help in our case, talk about the social and government context, the environmental context, and understand better the system and where it's gone wrong and hopefully what can make it right again. So I'm gonna show you one of, the, one of the objectives of this workshop and our meetings after that for many weeks was for each of the groups to put together a story. I'm gonna show you a few of the slides that pertain to the story that we told as a group. These folks come from, again, different continents. Um, and represent different countries from the Passamaquoddy Nation to Mexico, Denmark, Brazil, and then the others of us uh, for down East Maine, the counties in the US, different communities there. Um, so we started, of course, where many people would start the story. The context that fisheries have sustained our communities, they helped them start, they helped them sustain for thousands of years in the case of the Passamaquoddy people and the people before them. Um, but we also understand that we extracted eventually the fish at rates that compromise their renewable resource status. We pulled them faster than our ecosystem could provide. And while we were doing that, things were getting worse. In fact, the capacity of the ecosystem to produce this, these fish were compromised because we were building dams. Each dot here depicts a dam built in Maine from 1630 to present. And as you all well know, when you build the dams, you break that connection. The balance between lakes, rivers, and bay and sea that's vital for our coastal watersheds to help spur production in the uh, marine ecosystem and vice versa. And so fish like the alewife or river herring that could provide forage in the forage base for a marine ecosystem, but in fact, for forage all the way up into the freshwater ecosystem as they travel, uh, migrate, reproduce, uh, and, then, and then move to their nursery areas and beyond into the sea, those fish no longer have a viable life cycle. Um, and what we see over history is a gigantic crash in their numbers. This is just one of the stories we could tell. Um, and this one only goes from 1987 to present, as you know, from the last slide, and no on your own, no doubt, dams have been built here for hundreds of years. Um, but the record from 1987 shows what can happen when dams are closed, because it was a natural experiment in Maine, as many of you might know, that affected the boundary waters of the St. Croix River and beyond. This is an infographic that we put together that shows looking at just the harvests from Maine, what has happened since 1950s. What I wanna start with is at the top with that dark thick line, the blue line. What that depicts is the number of uh, fish in um, millions of pounds that were harvested in the Gulf of Maine to a large extent and landed in Maine. Right underneath that, you see a dashed line. That's a bit of a problem because what it shows is what the harvest would look like if you removed lobsters. And you can see that gap opening up from 1995 to present. 
And now 70 to 80% of the entire value of the fisheries in Maine is represented by a single species in lobsters. Underneath that, you'll see some donut graphs that show you the proportion of species groups that made up our harvest over time. Each of those graphs belongs to a star on the line above it. So we have one in 1955, 1980, 1995, and 2015. But instead of you know, blurring your eyes and trying to figure out what those numbers look like quantitatively, we've taken those donut graphs and turned them into iconic pictures where species groups are represented in the same size as the percentages in the donuts. So you're, you're looking at the proportional harvest in those icons in each one of those days when you look at those round circles below. What you can see is a dramatic change from a fishery that focused on ground fish and Atlantic herring to one that had its fits and starts, bounding from 300 million fish, which, which appears at least in this time as a ceiling, because we see that happen in the early days in the middle and then again um, in the 2000s. But there are crashes in between. This is a sign of serial overfishing, one species group after another. And again, what we're concerned about is we're left with a precarious dependence on a single species. And it's a species that you know has boomed like none other that I've seen in my lifetime, even in just data, much less in person. And this graphic, these two graphics demonstrate that. Let's focus on the left for now. That's a graph that looks at total lobster landings in orange in the state of Maine with the, um, with the index values on the left. And what you can see is from 1830 to about the mid 1990s, Maine was pulling in about 20 million pounds of lobster every year. Well, then we had the meteoric rise in the mid nineties. And in blue is now what you can expect to catch or what was caught in the just Washington County, Maine alone. And what's kind of scary to me is um, that we are so dependent on a fishery that seems so unusually um, large right now. You can see in blue on the right in that index, you see the same number of circle 20, that's 20 million pounds. We are now catching in Washington County alone what the entire state used to catch for many, many, many decades. Um, and when you pair that with what we know to be a pretty dynamic and vibrant coastal ocean um, and a changing coastal ocean and what that has done to lobster harvest over time as depicted in this graph in snapshots in about 10 or 15 years, each, each moving about 10 or 15 years from the 1960s. Um, you can see that there's been quite a bit of change. The question is, can this continue? And we're already seeing signs of stress in this singular fishery that we're dependent upon. That is shell disease, um, changes spatially, changes in season. Um, and perhaps most concerning is a general decline along this, the coast of Maine in the juvenile abundance indices that have been taken over time that spell seems to be building in a decline for the next as many as 10 years. We ended our conversations, our presentation as the rising tides, we were called at the time, with Chief Akaji's quote here, that this is not a new story. That is, it's not a new story of communities wrestling with their environment, trying to manage them appropriately and live within them in a sustainable way. It's a story we, that was started 14,000 years ago. And, and we as the living tides, as we said at the time, and all of us are, are here simply to try and make that story continue. With that sentiment, as I said, we move from the rising tides to the living tides. We decided as a group that we were gonna invite others into our group and share and build trust, build understanding of our system and see how we couldn't make a positive difference. So this is just a, a few of the folks that now exist in our weekly meetings. I've been meeting for a couple of years now, it feels like, I think so. <laughs> it's been a good couple of years. Um, we've built that trust. We've had those conversations. And again, this story is about how that has affected me and, and my ability to make the difference that I came here three years ago to try to make.
One person that helped me along this way is Denise Altvader. She's not pictured here. Uh, she is the wife of Brian Altvader, who is, and she's had a pretty big impact, um, both on how I thought about this region, what I understood about this region, and even how I might be able to help. That impact started with her sharing. It was a deep and long sharing. It built a lot of trust, um, watered a few eyes, and it was about the story of two tribal members that went out the clam one day that never made it back. They drowned in a canoeing accident. And the basics of the story is that they were out there looking for clams where they couldn't get clam, where they used to be able to get clams regularly on the shores of the Passamaquoddy settlement of Sabaya in Half Moon Cove. But production has dramatically fallen there. And that's what led them to go out on the water in less than safe conditions in a, in a, in a boat that really um, could be challenged by any kind of weather that might come up. And it ended very poorly, as we said. We talked about the importance, Denise talked, we listened, uh, about the importance of clams and Sabaya, how they fed their people for tens of thousands of years, uh, been very important. And um, again, they just aren't available in the numbers they used to be. There no doubt are a number of complex reasons for this. Um, but before we get into those, I want to I want to make sure everyone understands a little bit about where Pleasant Point, also named um, called Sabayak, is located in, in Maine. It's really nestled between Cobscook Bay and Passamaquoddy Bay. So we consider it part of the St. Croix watershed. On the right is a blow-up of the section on the left. And I call your attention to both Half Moon Cove, um, Sabayak itself and also the Route 190 causeway that connects Sabai to Eastport. So after learning so much from Alan and Denise Altvader and Brian Altvader and other members of the tribe and living tides, it occurred to us that one of the members in the Down East Fisheries Partnership, the Down East Institute in particular, had some skills and capacities and understandings that we might be able to put to good use in Sabaya. They'd already worked with towns, experimenting with ways to ameliorate, to battle the green crab and its pred uh, predation on green, on uh, soft shell clams. So we talked to Brian Beal and Kyle Pepperman and the executive director of the Down East Institute, Diane Tilton, They'd all been working on this together and we pitched this idea. How about if we took your process, your methods and provided some technical support for the clamors and the community in Sabaya to see if we couldn't change the situation, adapt to this climate change pressure and help them recover some of the productivity in clams that help them in terms of food security and incomes for their families. We put together a proposal, which is now under review from a funding organization to, for a three-year, four-year project that would plant gardens in successive years of as many 50 plots that were about 12 by 12 feet, that is, so 144 square feet, planted with um, young clams that the Down East Institute raises that are hopefully a little bit larger than the young crabs each year and eat. Additionally, for each of those plots within a garden, an annual garden, we cover them with a net. Between the, the fact that we have slightly larger and slightly older clams for a bit of a size refugia and the active protection of the net, we believe that Sabayak might be able to get much more productive clamming from their flats. And in fact, we started last year five of those plots and a mini garden and found good survival and good growth. In running the numbers, we think each of these annual plots as they come to maturity can be harvested to provide as many as nine, maybe even more meals for every single person in Zabaya. Additionally, these conversations help me learn more about the problem. And the good news is that 
I've been able to bring the Downey's Fisheries Partnership and some of our funding partners into the conversations that started when the Passamaquoddy at Sabayak applied for a grant from the U.S. Corps of Army Engineers. It was their predecessor organization that built the dams on the causeway from Half Moon or over that, that isolated Half Moon Cove. And we are now in the second year of a two-year study where the Corps of Engineers is going to put together a plan for reinitiating full tidal circulation between Coffs Cook Bay through Half Moon Cove to Pass Maquoddy. We're hoping that'll do many, many things for the tribe. Among those many is to enhance the productivity and of the ecosystem in Half Moon Cove. As we look to the future, I'm hoping I can take another project and introduce uh, the Passamaquoddy to a larger extent in conversations around the Eastern Maine Coastal Current Collaborative. That's a collaborative between NOAA, the Downey's Fisheries Partnership, in particular, the Maine Center of Coastal Fisheries and Maine's Department of Natural Resources. And the idea is to take a more ecosystems appropriate approach to fisheries policy that includes communities, includes fishermen, includes their values, includes their local knowledge and helps them look to the future to um, hopefully a fisheries complex that isn't serially overfished anymore, but fished in a way that's a little bit more compatible with the ecosystem productivity and how we know ecosystems work. So with that all end, I hope what I conveyed to you was one person's appreciation uh, for what building trust with local community members can mean and how it can bring power to our jobs, to our persons in trying to undo some of the damage that we've done as we've developed as communities, as we've tried to harness nature's power um, for our economy and for our communities. 